Hello everyone, today we talk about Sarmatian, Bosphoran and Roman warfare on the eve of the new era in the northern Pontic shores and also a bit beyond sometimes, also in the southern for that matter, ex excluding the, the Bosphorans, but even there some, some auxiliary force may have been roaming around. Recently, as you know, I started this series about, uh, you know, the essentially western, mostly western Eurasian steps warfare from the beginning to the end, but I also recently made a video about Sar the Sarmatians, or Sarmatian history um, in general. Uh, I've seen that these videos for some reasons are uh, much more watched than, than the average, and I'm simply exploiting that because I objectively have uh, a lot um, about these peoples, and as you know, I, th these are just general introductions, Right, we have already seen here and there maybe some unit type, some kind of battle or military organization more in depth, but we are at the very, 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 very beginning with that. Um, this is, I decided to speed this series kind of up because it can provide me with, you know, uh, a larger uh, pool of subscribers. But for that matter, I think still it's a very important topic to discuss because it shows you a bit the um, the proximity even in the distance between these cultures and places um, over time, we've seen how the steps grow, right, from a military point of view, how actually most of what they develop in as a unique um, uh, warfare feature, we could say, actually happens drawing bits and pieces from uh, sanitary military technologies, right, and then adapting to their to their traditions and developing um, accordingly. Um, this uh, I tried to highlight, especially inserting the sedentary population. Talk so about the, the Scythians and the Cimmerians, but also the Greeks at the same time, the Sakas, the Kushans, but also the Macedons. So today we talk about the Sarmatians, the Bosporan kingdom that basically had been developing from uh, from Hellenic times, becoming uh, 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 a Roman client state, so also being unavoidably Romanized, but also being very influenced, right, by um, by the the Iranian peoples in um, essentially in the northern shores of the Black Sea, Crimea, the, the Azov Sea, and so on. Um, and we will keep seeing this over time because you know that there are the, the Byzantines, the Italians, and so on. That over time. Um, uh, took to control of this area and uh, interacted with the steppes peoples, right? So this this um, uh, th this war, this region was a bit of a gateway, actually, properly the, the coastal area, even more than kind of the the more uh, extensive territorial frontiers, right? That would really catalyze most of the influences, the changes, uh, and so on. Um, in uh, especially in Western Eurasian warfare. Um, in the f let's start just with with a story because let's say in that in the late first millennium BC, early first millennium AD, century more, century less, the northern shores of the Black Sea uh, remained um, one of the centers of classical civilization. Right, constantly in contact indeed with this barbarian we can't say world of the steps, right? And what strikes you about this difference is that, especially given that these coastlines were had been colonized by the Greeks, and so they developed uh, essentially a urban civilization, uh, and they were, generally speaking, prosperous, also because of the trade, the exports of the grains from, from the northern um, Pontic shores and so on. It, that they had, they did have an important degree of material force, right? They had the capacity of adapting to different challenges, developing certain characteristic styles uh, of armor, and, and naturally being um, connected with wh whichever hegemonic empire in Mediterranean uh, could um, could come to to rule on them, telling the truth. So this is valid, evidently, for the uh, for Hellenistic times, for Roman times, and of course Rome had a a presence in the area, most 
Lee, uh, um, they ruled uh, this region through proxies, through again client states, right? Uh, puppet kings, right? They that were part of the local uh, dynasties. Some had come from Pontus back in the day because that was the original power in the southern shores of, of the Black Sea that had uh, eventually expanded uh, in the area. Um, so th there is a lot, even just in terms of shared military traditions. Uh, and the steppes war had always been that turbulent in the interland for these communities to mind, right? Uh, naturally, it was very difficult for the, the steppes peoples to literally seize these cities. Mostly, they contented themselves with exercise, even their sort of kind of um, lordship without permanently occupying them, because they were very different from their uh, their background. Um, but they mm, received, as we were noticing before, so substantial influence from them. These were the center of, for example, some of the, the, the finest uh, arms and armor imports that were coupled to the already quite developed um, Iranian warfare uh, in the steppe. Now, by this time, various tribes, as we've seen in the video about the Sarmatians, had migrated from beyond the Don River, uh, from actually very far away places sometimes. Uh, the closest were, you know, the steppes of the Volga region, essentially, but uh, we can count Central Asia, and even Siberia, right? And these peoples, this Iranian, this branch of the Iranian populations, were known as uh, to, to classical authors um, and ethnographers as the Sarmatians. Again, I made videos on them, so I will not be repeating myself. Um, but these were essentially the, the next wave after the uh, Scythians of Indo-European populations that uh, consolidated in the area. Except um, the Sarmatian world was very large, right? So we're talking about... Um, uh, there was a substantial ethnic homogeneity, but there were also many other peoples that we do not know how to identify immediately or directly um, uh, in, uh, in origin, in ethnogenesis, uh, and so on. In any case, uh, this was, the again, the, the phase of Indo-European dominance uh, in the steppes, also very far away, as we've seen, uh, f uh, far East, as we've seen in that video about the Sakas, the Kushats, etc. Things were getting in motion already, so we will see this better in the next chapter, where uh, the what we call the migration era from our Western sedentary perspective, but that for these peoples had been somehow the normality in the way, um, would um, trigger uh, dramatic changes, pushing some of these peoples even further to eventually sedentarize. Um, as they had been mostly crushed at one point. But the Sarmatians, as we've seen, topped, generally speaking, or at least th this is the point. Um, when we look uh, at the, um, you know, mounted warfare developed by the Sakas, the Kushans, and so on, we we say, okay, well, so, so these are Sakas, Kushans, they're not Sarmatians, aren't they? Well, this is the actual empiricism of the definitions, because... Even those we call as the Sarmatians and even, and especially the, the Alani, were coming from very far away places. And so their ethnic identity was mostly and foremost about political cohesion, not much of anything else. They, they wouldn't, first of all, they, they would absorb whoever they came to, to conquer, right, and to rule and to bring to, to the port essentially with, uh, with them along the way. But the point was, the, the main deal of all was maintaining an actual unitary functionary, functional power of some kind, right? Um, when, naturally in the steps, what you mostly see is uh, a confederacy. You may have even, say, within this confederacy, usually there is an hegemonic tribe that has managed to, again, um, subdue the others until she basically floats or across the steps on on the shoulders of these people, let's put it this way. Um, but there are also different confederacies at the same time. There is a degree of um, sedentarism already because uh, these peoples eventually settle somewhere, especially towards the, you know, the, the closest areas um, to, to the sanitary world in, in the first place. 
but this was their limit in as much they couldn't quite settle down in more developed areas, more fertile areas, simply because they, they lacked the tools to just uh, overwhelm those those civilizations, but also at that point also maintaining their own their own originary uh, character and lifestyle and also military um, culture, right, as we know. That. So, naturally, there were areas in which uh, sanitaries and nomads coexisted throughout all this time. If you look at the, probably the, the westernmost fringes uh, in Central Europe, um, the, the Prod- with the Protoss labs, with, with other, I don't know, um, Celts, Germans, etc., that at some point even took over the same, um, at least part of um, of this people's system, and in some cases even blending with them. Um, you realize that, uh, of course, uh, the the westernmost went, and the more we've seen it also for the Scythians, the more sanitary characteristics these peoples would acquire, and we will see it. Um, in fact, uh, with the Sarmatian invasions, because. Uh, not just, um, as we've seen, Central Asia had been the theater of a significant military development, especially in the late 1st millennium AD, probably the creation of what we would call the, the cataphract, right? And even more kind of um, uh, in, intense uh, combined arms tactics between the, the shock and the missile element. Um, but the... Uh, the Scythians uh, from their side had somehow softened up and in the, the westernmost areas they had even not really abandoned the, the bow but you know having increased for example the amount of uh, of infantry of of, uh, of javeliners right so gradually um, settling down and this thing would go on for, for a long time because uh, it's not really about technology it's also about how you you really exploit the land, um, but uh, of course, for for um, for millennia, the, the spaces, right, of, especially the one of the step, right, and uh, were were more difficult to settle in from from a sanitary uh, standpoint, and more or less the, the boundaries remain similar in spite of the gradual erosion of the steps at, at the end of of, of the sanitary. Um, so I will not even stress how many um, again genetic variations there could be here and there we, we, um, especially during the migration era this would turn in, in a massive blend of practically so that even there politically speaking we call a people a certain ethnicity but it was actually the sum of multiple ones right and, uh, they couldn't quite even distinguish clearly at some point. You're, at best, you can be lucky in finding some kind of genetic relics um, in just basically the only graves of of the elite, right? You know that that it usually indicates naturally who was the most successful people that had taken over the other orientatively, but we don't have statistically this huge amount of sound information in the first place. We rely basically on documentary evidence and ethnographic uh, anthropological insight because objectively that that does make more sense than, than a certain historiography would have liked to, to make you believe that it's all a strange stereotyping and misunderstanding and and uh, you know and uh, wrong view of, of, of this uh, of this world. Um, so the Sarmatians had essentially routed the Scythians in order to, to settle uh, in their land. It was a gradual process, but we can't avoid to notice that there was a substan- there had been a substantial wave right, of peoples from, from Central Asia causing this shift. The Scythians were in part uh, assimilated, in part annihilated, and the Sarmatians... Uh, essentially took their place also the, within the, the geographic uh, previous geographic boundaries um, eventually pouring even further west through some raids uh, um, breaking for example through uh, to the Danube 
beginning to attack the Transdanubian Dacians, and later the Romans, who had uh, conquered uh, the region. Right? Um, even there, there were significant boundaries maintained. Right, The Dacians and the Romans always had the upper hand in the Carpathian Basin, and that's essentially what they cared about, because it was full of mineral resources. The Sarmatians at best could come to harass them, uh, here and there, especially in the uh, corridor between uh, the Danube and the Carpathians in the west, the Yadzigas at some point were, because the Sarmatians were actually f fighting within themselves, were atrocious feuds, and um, this tribe specifically was pushed westwards, participated also in the Marcomannic Wars. Um, there are interesting stories there. There were some Sarmatians who sided with, say, the enemies of the uh, Germanic proxies uh, of uh, of the Quadi, for example. Trajan used um, Sarmatian mercenaries, and Rome, generally speaking, began to hire Sarmatian auxiliaries um, during their campaigns. Uh, these hybrids would leave a mark, right? Because, as we will see now, the Romans did begin to imitate cataphract warfare, from from Persia, but also from Sarmatia, um, and the as you know the the origin was practice of this type of um, combat was the same, right? Uh, the sedentary peoples never had too much fortune with the imitation of cataphract forces, uh, if not by lightening some of them and still integrating them in a in a more complex system than the original one of the steps. These are also, times change over time. The Byzantines at some point, for example, mastered a substantial amount of cataphract warfare, but it wasn't the one that would solve their their issues. Also, the Sasanians basically uh, developed, uh, actually reduced the degree of cataphractness, let's say, that the, the, the Arsacids, telling the truth, had pioneered further at some point in... Um, uh, in Persia, we've seen it uh, the other time that the heaviest armor actually was was produced in uh, not even the steppes. At least it depends on what we're talking about. But let's say in, in western uh, in western Eurasia, at least uh, aside from Central Asia and the Indo Scythian War, it was in fact quite similar to the Parthian one. That it was the Arsacids that um, I mean military wise was the Arsacids that. Um, uh, pushed things a little bit further and with certain type of armor that they mediated as well from, from the Celts, from the Romans. They used mail, as we will see, and there is a little debate about where did that did originate, uh, as a matter of fact, because um, the, um, the idea is that mail is Celtic, right? Telling the truth, we find uh, even uh, uh, older... Uh, male used by the Etruscans, for example. And given just the location of the earliest Celtic uh, chain mail that is in Slovakia, it wouldn't be so strange that that type of armor had already had, um, in fact, had had something to do originally with the Iranian peoples as well in the steppes. Um, in any case, uh, this this uh, armor was, in fact, developed further, as we will see now. And there was even probably a coming back from the sanitary world, where at this point, probably the Romans had spread mail um, everywhere, and uh, so much so that they influenced the same Sarmatians uh, in that regard. Uh, because, again, don't let yourself be fooled by the indeed impressive and kind of glorious cataphract standard, because uh, these steps were still pretty poor, right, in essence, and the Sarmatians in the West had actually a lighter gear than, on average, than their Central Asian counterparts, right, um, so the Central Asia was literally the forge, right, doesn't matter how, um, again, how, um, let's say, uh, the 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 civil the sedentary civilizations influenced in the actual uh, material uh, say the, the 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 single elements the single tools uh, to put together this this panoply uh, but the highest standards were the ones as we've seen 
uh, reached uh, in, uh, in 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 Central Asia uh, across this area, straddling really the entire steppes and having this central position. Also, because they could they they, they could have more option in that regard. The Sarmatians came to be a bit like the Scythians originally, to just to settle there and to gradually uh, lose even this original toughness, right? Uh, as it happened to all the ones that came closer to the to the enemy to to the to the senatorial world. Um, the uh, that with um, with the Romans, the Sarmatians had to clash in Crimea, in the Lower Don region, as well. Think about Nero's expedition for grain in the area. There were uh, Roman uh, campaigns there. I, I can make a video about them. Um, also, quite risky situations because again, uh, there was uh, Tanais. Normally, it was the the most important uh, port there, and then you could uh, rise up, you know, the the river. But um, the of course the the risk of being cut out, right, in your supply lines by some shrewd step people's maneuver, uh, strategically speaking, was, was quite consistent. Considered the Romans didn't didn't have really the geographical awareness of the existence of more or less today's geographic Russia, right? So uh, they, in spite of the fact that Roman artifacts are to be found in, uh, even in the U up to the Urals and so on, so they these peoples knew what Rome was from the other side, but the Romans, of course, didn't consider them as essentially as a threat. Uh, for the aforementioned uh, reasons, right? But they wanted resources, and so they began to to extend uh, uh, in the area, too. Um, another theater uh, that saw the clash between the Romans and the Sarmatians was Transcaucasia, right? Uh, so south of the Caucasus Mountains. Given that, as you know, the Romans controlled basically Asia Minor, they um, Controlled uh, at times uh, Armenia that they were contending uh, from uh, to to the Parthians, uh, and these Sarmatians, famously enough, uh, as we know from Arian's work, in fact, describing how to cope tactically with the with the Alani. Uh, this the, this peoples launched um, raids um, pretty deep to the. Eastern part of the empire as well as we've seen the 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 Scythians had been doing this from millennia fundamentally, and they uh, and and Rome was stable enough naturally to prevent major breakthroughs at, at this point. Um, but there was a general character of the Eastern Front theater was in fact um, also feudal in nature, a bit more um, a bit less linear than. The still not really linear limes in some other parts of, for example, of Central or Northern Europe, um, that depended also on the varying allegiance of the local subjects. Right, Rome was perfectly aware uh, of the cost-benefit uh, ratio uh, for occupying or just you know controlling by proxy cer certain areas. And naturally, there were infiltrations of these war bands. Right? They were quite, in fact, um, uh, militaristically minded, not less than than the Romans that at this point had emerged properly as a as a major civilization and and state and in fact permanent professional force, and to say the least. Um, and um, you can argue that the, the these peoples were a bit the the hammer and the, the, the Romans were the 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 anvil, right? And what was happening in between were, was a very interesting hybrid of military culture that we're going to attemptively describe right now. Uh, the Sarmatians scored their biggest successes in the first century A.D. This is the moment in which they were the strongest. Right, and specifically the time in which the uh, Alani, the Alanians, um, who 
had moved into the northern Pontic area from as far as from the steppes of the Tian Shan, right? So that's the range, right, of these people's movements and how, you know, straight from the, the most radically and brutally militaristic core of, of Central Asia, the, the Alani really were. And again, I made a video about the Alani specifically. We could make videos about other Sarmatian tribes, but as you know, these were the the butt kickers, right? These were essentially the epitome of Indo-European uh, uh, warrioristic militarism to the divine extent of remaining even when crushed and kind of marginalized during the migration era, basically providing bodyguards to all the greatest empires around, the Romans, the Chinese, the Mongols. Um, so maintaining the highest level of equestrian, in fact, uh, military horsemanship, right? Um, and uh, this kind of fanaticistic in the, um, warrior uh, individualism that really finds no other match and that basically is all the, the spring from which a great part of our nightly um, uh, revival in, in the Middle Ages was really about, right? All the uh, Indo-European peoples, even the ones that had been sedentarized from millennia, had in their memory this thing of the, of, of the horse, of kind of the divine rule, um, of, of coming from the steppes and uh, so much so that we have basically unfortunately on the light of the enlightenment presumed that even the, the, the Greeks and the Romans were some kind of democratic republics when they were basically some oligarchic but not feudal systems as a matter of fact that put a dramatic emphasis on the it doesn't matter sometimes symbolically especially in Greece but to cavalry as such Right? I say Greece, not Macedon. I try to divide the two things in this regard because the Macedons were in fact dramatically close or to even this, the steppe uh, world, the Scythians, the northern Thracians. But the same concept of the Equus as the knight right? and the, the greater importance over the other citizens. The same goes among the Germans uh, from Tacitus, uh, in fact, uh, Germania that had still these uh, rights connected to the the, 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 the divine um, connection of, of the horses uh, to the to, to the universal power um, for not talking about the Celts that uh, were obsessed with horses obviously they didn't have much of a collectively qualitative cavalry as most people still inexplicably and embarrassingly believe up to this point but again this thing was everywhere um, even before the migration era. The migration era re-injected it uh, at a much greater uh, level for many reasons. Not much the physical injection of these people but in the west from, from the east but probably the feudalization of the system so the revival of the also individual kind of um, training and this over load of you know of armor of you know of cost of, of, of lifestyle um on horseback right that uh, would mature also for reasons that basically have nothing to do with the steps during the middle ages further mostly in the frankish world paradoxically through the through the the the, the heaviest degree of sedentarism of the gallo roman latifundi as a matter of fact but that's um that's another that's another story um, in any case, that's how deep the influence of the sarmato alanians really uh, would have come to, to be, right? Even when assimilated, but not subjugated, for example, by peoples like the, the gods, right? So when having failed, basically, in a, in a broader political sense. Um, so this military province uh, was characterized by a new military system, that we have seen in the last video about the Sagas, that had been at this point further improved, especially as far as tactics were were concerned, starting from from the individual gear. That of course it, it goes always um, you know in uh, in parallel. Actually, it's tactics that made this panoply, not the other way around. Uh, and in fact, uh, the major feature being the um, the, the, the 
proficient use of properly equipped heavy cavalry as the shock force alternated with the hit and run um, action of the horse archers so really in the same way we've seen with the parties there were some differences right um, in fact the offens offensive weapons of the sarmato alanians um, were very similar to the one of both the Parthians and the Kushans that maintained uh, also a close connection as we've seen as far as their armament was concerned. Um, they included a long spear, four meters long, with a large head, um, a long, that is one meter and longer, sword with the pommel in the shape of a stone disc that basically helped um, you know, handling it towards a sort of one and a half uh, direction. And showing also the force and the, again, probably the, the knightly type of combat that this entailed. Um, th there were massive weapons designed properly to, to damage armor, to find the, the weaker spots, the joints, etc., to, to penetrate uh, dramatically into the enemy uh, and uh, this, um, this this type of warfare would remain pretty much uh, the same at least during the the, the, the moment of Indo-European uh, hegemony over the steppes right this was relatively recent but these were essentially uh, massive um, straight blades right there is there is there are basically not sabers around Right, this would mostly come from in in other times that I will try to explain. In fact, in the next series, but having to do also a bit with the with the collapse that the migration era had entailed, because actually training um, horsemen with a saber was was much uh, cheaper than with this kind of weapons. At least um, there were, as we will see now, secondary arms used by, of course, the Sarmatians uh, and other peoples. But um, the idea that in the steps you have this greater desperation for which uh, peoples uh, do not uh, have even just that they are worn out, right? They do not have much personal wealth and they follow en masse this, is that ultra rich um, uh, elites, right? That uh, are not even particularly eager to share their, their wealth anymore at that point. Uh, produces much vaster masses of lighter troops than before. You can argue that in Iranian times the steppes had been more knightly, right? Even more mm, kind of, uh, in part even more sanitary, as a matter of fact. Uh, and uh, say tendentially, so as we've seen, this is what happens to the steppe in general. But properly, in order to, to feel this kind of fairly spread, it was still elite. Right, but it was a, a more spread elite than um, the, the the one uh, uh, exist in Turco Mongolian times. Right, um, suggests that um, warfare was tending hopefully towards a more uh, uh, at least towards a, a greater stabilization before again the migration era happened. To shatter the wall system, that even the need of large masses of peoples moving in raids was not needed. The Sarmatians tried to to keep things together with enormous difficulty, because again they were not a unique people. Uh, but let's say, especially the the, the rise of the uh, Alani, right, to an hegemonic uh, status um, in uh, in the Sarmatian world. Um, after having taken out even the originary royal Sarmatians and so on, and the the enorm in fact the, no the enormous territorial ex extent of their dominion probably was favored by this gradual settlement, right? Um, and the the long spear was again designed basically to knock out a uh, a heavy cavalryman during the charge, as the sword was instead for clo in closer combat. Um, and uh, it, the, the, this weapons required um, an unspeakable level of training, right? And they um, came together with a mentality that 
would have gradually disappeared towards the migration here that is um, probably the the most originary one of the of the, um, of the night the sense that they doesn't matter how effective these peoples now were uh, also for the degree of collecting training achieved but still the presence of the shock force sometimes still with, with the idea that the knight could be still an archer at the same time and um, trying to again push li literally to, to the individual uh, human limit this kind of personal capacities was a bit more there than it would be later. It doesn't matter how brutal the step uh, always remained Nobody in the sanitary world basically had an idea what it meant from a in a truly singular fashion to be trained like that, right? A Roman legionnaire would have been would have undergone some of the most radically you know I don't even have the ad, the exact adjective to describe this accurately, but something that literally destroyed these people like in pieces and you know, broke them together as another human being, right? But from a collective point of view, right? The Sarmatians had that because mostly they spent their entire life on horseback. Um, but in the absence of a statal force capable of coercing, right, from from the top um, and uh, delivering even a degree of uniformity in training, etc., most of the shortcomings of the systems were still compensated by an idea of heroic uh, brutality, right? This existed actually also in the sedentary world. I mean, the, the, the legionnaire was actually considered on the grounds of, you know, uh, the same freeman tradition, a sort of super freeman, right? A sort of nobleman, as long as he could bear a sword. The same concept was present among the Germans, among the Celts, right? So not, not all people were alike at all, right? But in the steps, this was definitely more evident, because the knight was definitely a superhuman compared to the average guy just with a bow and basically barely any armor, right? And as we'll see, the, the same Sarmatians were, were not particularly heavy as you you would think right the, the concept of the night was there but they were definitely lighter than their central asian uh uh neighbors right or at least especially the ones of kushan and by the group probably even the partins given that they had increased at least the the amount of you know of resources they could draw from their essentially sedentary uh, dominations not talking about the Indo Scythians and, and so on. So yes, the the when I say Central Asia, I don't mean necessarily the you know the the northernmost part of, of the steppes, right north probably the, the most uh, the wilder areas, but the ones that were at the crossroad between India, China and uh, Persia and even the you know the Pontic uh, steppe in the westernmost end, right? Which is again, I said everything, it's a huge area. But it's a very specific crossroad from which these peoples had come from and had essentially evolved militarily to exactly exploit the weaknesses of the sedentaries when they could. Um, another distinctive uh, element of this armation gear was the scabbard secured uh, to the sword belt through a, a special loop or slide such slides were of Chinese workmanship that were frequently brought directly from China. It was easy for even somebody living in the Pontic Steppe because the trade routes passed from there. Uh, uh, the, again, the, the distances are pretty big, but it, it's never been particularly difficult for humans to, to move, right? You know, never confuse the... Uh, let's say the very gradual political territorial changes that occur locally with what literally a man can cross uh, <laughs> concerning space for every time. That's probably the single most uh, um, overlooked element in, in human history, right? The world war can be crossed very quickly without much of a problem. 
what we um, pointed out in the uh, last video in which we were explaining how the scabbard had come about in the first place and pointing out the Chinese origin, we observed that, um, uh, of course, there is not such thing like a, a passive copy, right? Technology doesn't quite work like that. The, the Sarmatians had all the capacity of, of evidently developing that on the basis of their traditional warfare, right? Just when they came to reform their armies after the contact with the with the Chinese, with the Achaemenids, with, with, with Alexander the Great at Gaugamela, at the Yaxartes, etc., they drew from the designs that were uh, already more there. And definitely, even though um, China appears to be, again, a bit like we, we decided to parallel to, to the Romans, and so this idea of kind of modern state, allegedly, in for the Romans too, actually, the uh, uh, Empire of the Dragon was much more of a feudal system than Rome, and some high dignitaries, leaders, uh, commanders, etc., already tended towards this greater degree of feudal equipment, right? So all these, um, even the, the decorations, etc., stemmed from what was evidently a much more feudal, privatistic, and socially uh, stratified world than, than the Roman one really was. Right, um, the Chinese already had their own specific um, social segmentation. They had just the masses alienated mostly from from um, from the from the political control. Rome emerged, after all, from something much more similar to to a tribal world. Um, even though we mostly, again, as from a uh, narrowly Western perspective would just see them op diametrically opposed to, say, I don't know, the Germans or the Celts, whatever, but actually also as their way of war uh, evidences with the, the, the brutal um, prevalence of heavy infantry, even in combination with the other arms that in China were somehow more um, more loaded, right? Including cavalry and etc. They had crossbows, they had uh, Pretty interesting things, even weapons that required uh, um, a more collective use in terms of pole arms, um, formation. This was not really necessarily something more effective on the field, but definitely they had an impressive, let's say, comparatively with some other peoples. It's just they, they had developed their, their system on a, on a different political and social uh, combination. Right, the Romans at this time went just, you know, it's basically the average guy is, is a is a soldier, right, in a thickly packed infantry formation that you you can't barely enter in the first place, and of course the Senate, the legions were superior to to the peoples. There, there is no doubt about that, and not only because of their complement of auxiliaries of other, basically the same peoples, nomadic, uh, numeric, for example. Not even because of the catapults that, as we've seen, made a great impression um, uh, with the Sarmatians when they, they they with the excuse me with the, with the Saka when the uh, when they they were you know uh, basically dislodged from the river uh, to, from the banks of the river Yaxartes by in fact by the Macedonian ones that were very new by the way as torsion catapults that could. On that occasion, it just transpass a heavily armored Saka warrior, right? Um, it was about the the heaviness of infantry that really mattered uh, at this point. The Sarmatians also were equipped with a short dagger in, in a sheath with four twin loops, enabling the dagger to be strapped to the right hip and to the belt. This weapon was very useful in uh, many circumstances, also non-military one. You want to skin animals, you want to cut uh, wood, at least, I don't know, create arrows, uh, all things like that. Um, but it has a very important function in close combat that at some point would be almost a, a wrestling match that is stabbing um, brutally uh, an enemy, a uh, heavily armored enemy, 
right? Especially in those areas that were kind of more exposed, um, the joints of the armor again, and, and, and so on. Um, the, the Sarmatians did dismount for fighting as well. We've seen it. It, it happened among the Scythians, perhaps a bit less, um, but just it's just speculative. Uh, but agree. In any case, their um, engagement were uh, contemplating a substantial degree of of melee, uh, as we've seen. The shock moment was was really there. Uh, both heavy and light cavalry were equipped with powerful bows of the composite type that also had been evolving um, fairly recently. Right, uh, these bows were first of all larger than those of the Scythians, right? Even though, as you know, the, the composite bow is generally speaking more compact because, you know, it can perform even with, um, uh, 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 let's say, a dramatically less stretch even though with, with an increased force necessary. These Sarmatian bows uh, had a longer range compared to the Scythian ones as they were reinforced with the horny uh, facing plates right? that increased um, uh, the, the draw uh, and the um, arrows of these bows had trilobate iron heads that albeit existing from quite a while they became elementally generalized uh, at this point the bow and arrows were kept by the Sarmatian warrior in a Goritos akin to that of the Parthians and the Kushans, which demonstrates military cultures of these peoples. Um, we could easily make videos about the coordination, for example, of Sarmatian attacks to the Roman Empire also with, with the Parthians. It was a general sense that things were done um, of course for political reasons not much because of uh, military kinship right the Sarmatians uh, at a point did create problems uh, to to the Parthians uh, as well uh, in general however this was again the the world or also the world of the steppe and in its hairs we can say still trying to break the uh, against the the, the greatest um, you know civiliz sedentary civilizational boundaries, right? And without much uh, of a success, telling the truth. Um, the differences, by the way, between the Sarmatians and the Parthians are more evident in the defensive gear. The Sarmatians in the uh, northern Pontic steppe. Um, do not seem to have made um, you know dramatic amount of armor right and not only of all the types of defensive gear they preferred the mail coat borrowed from the Romans right so uh, an aspect that we do not appreciate further again is how much the the sanitary world influenced the steps you can argue that the Sarmatians fell in a more kind of Western Eurasian uh, dimension. As we've seen, the Parthians uh, took uh, mail, uh, essentially keeping together some substantial um, amount of, uh, of plate, uh, their cataphracts, from, from Rome um, herself, and say mail that had been spreading from a while in parallel also among the, the other peoples. Um, there was lo surely even before the, the Roman conquest uh, a lot of you know different uh, mercenaries around Celts uh, that used uh, the code of mail but the, the same italics sometimes un underappreciated in their uh, international uh, service let's say uh, as mercenaries. In any case um, uh, the um, the greater reliance on the code of mail uh, may have had to do also with a less intense uh, missile warfare uh, in in the Pontic steppe than say in in Central Asia, as the code of mail, generally speaking, is uh, more about pairing uh, slashing 
than than piercing and thrusting. Um, this is a bit of a kind of uh, speculation in the sense that at least doesn't matter how these uh, types perform. From a military point of view, what matters is mostly whether you're armored or not, right? Which, as a as a factor, may be just much bigger in this comparison, right? Consider the Sarmatians had naturally scaled armor reinforcing uh, the coat of mail, right? But um, the the fact that still the latter was substantially present, um, say mo substantially more present than in other. Um, among other instant populations is, is meaningful. Uh, scales could be um, woven into the male coat in the shape of, of scales or worn as a separate armor with scales soon uh, to a leather or linen base. And this uh, form um, adopted, the latter form adopted by the, the Sarmatians was also Roman in origin. We somehow overlook also how much um, you know scale armor the Romans were kind of on their own right how we how present it was already you know before the Roman conquests uh, in the Mediterranean uh, for again reasons that do not have to do with this say stereotype that it's just because of step warfare um, and and its influences even more Romanly speaking, Sarmatian armor was occasionally decorated with phalerae, right, richly ornamented metal disc shaped twin breastplates, as the Roman legionnaires, especially the centurions, uh, were decorated uh, with. Um, Sarmatian horses were only rarely barded. That's yet another very important uh, thing to, to bear in mind. Um, just already having, uh, let's say, a horseman entirely covered in, in metal is the indicator of an enormous wealth, right? Um, covering an entire horse in, in armor to create a full cataphract is uh, something ever, even more exceptional. And telling you the truth, it, it's something you can afford only together with a much larger core of troops because this thing is so heavy and so costly that you must renounce to lots of other options which especially uh, considering the the broader raiding skirmishing um, strategies and tactics of, of the steps right it's not something so just even usual to to field right and here we go back to the point of the last video it is to say such heavier cavalry had been developed mostly to cope with the sedentary infantries, the quite well armored ones, and we know how the Romans coped with the Sarmatians, naturally, you know, uh, reversing on them uh, an impressive amount of missile fire, as much you know, or even more actually than the Sarmatians could do, um, uh, say, awaiting them with their pila and actually also spears because the Romans not just the auxiliaries but the legionnaires as well did use their own lances more often than were brought the thing so again here is not much the, the tactical functionality of it but just the, the likelihood of Sarmatian raids uh, in the first place right their strategic objectives are, are different from the one uh, of the Romans but there was a I'd say a, a large enough frontier from from Central Europe to Armenia and even beyond sometimes that um, surely tested the Roman uh, reaction to, to these people. And not just uh, the Roman one because um, the uh, renowned glory of the Sarmatian knights and their effectiveness um, in tactics and kind of, you know, the quality of their armor, etc. brought also other people, right? namely the, the same Roman subjects that we have seen living at the, at the outskirts of the, of the empire to adapt to these populations. Um, the 
uh, most obvious reaction, as we've seen also for Sith Hellenic Warfare, was to um, just create more mobile troops. In other words, hiring the same horsemen of the steppes uh, that were quite available around. They supported this or that um, Bosphoran Roman client. This the Bosphorans again, the Bosphoran kingdom. This um, the essentially the Greeks, in fact, the men at arms from various autochthonous and newly come nations, were the ones who coped the most against the, the Sarmatians. So, creating more flexible heavy, say, more flexible infantries, increasing missile fire, um, and receiving a help. Uh, of of um, of influences from from these same peoples, so sort of hybrid between the uh, the Sarmatians, uh, the Romans, and even uh, other you know, for example, Middle Eastern cultures. Um, surely, um, the Bosphoran Kingdom, though uh, a dependency of Rome, uh, had been uh, culturally independent. Right, uh, these were the areas that uh, had been part of the broader Hellenistic world, and Rome had always, you know, adopted a sort of Alexandrian type of, of approach. Right, there had never been dramatic problems. Yes, the distance could bring them to try to, to autonomize themselves, but again, there weren't many opportunities around. There was just the steppes or, or the sea, right? And the sea was Rome's, and the steppes were just the peoples that didn't want to. You know, to to have to do much with Hellenistic culture uh, in the first place. Um, so, in general, we can appreciate this. Um, you know, the, the the gradual evolution also of the Bosphoran kingdom uh, before it would, before it was destroyed by uh, the, the same populations a later a later time moment of the crisis uh, of the third century, the migration era setting in. And other peoples actually coming from the West, such as the Germans, mostly carrying uh, this out. Uh, still, however, on a base, or, you know, uh, Atlantic culture would remain for, for a long time. Now, we don't need to present the Romans just per se. Uh, admittedly, I should make many more videos about Roman warfare, because it's really an evergreen and... Uh, fortunately, we, we do know enough in absolute terms, maybe not in relative ones. We know terribly few about the Roman army telling the truth in, in an historical sense, but there's a lot to discuss. Um, in any case, as we were pointing out before, the backbone of the Roman army was, of course, the, the legionary, right? Who was a heavily armed infantryman. Um, the Roman panoply remained substantially the same throughout the centuries. Yes, we're all fixated with all the various differences in Roman armor, etc. But as, as I was saying before, it's not really much about which type of armor, the, the degree of what, what this guy fundamentally is as a, as a heavy infantryman remains. Right, We are in pre-industrial times, there aren't major changes uh, at this point, as you know. Uh, we, we, we're also not really documented on the for example, the degree of, uh, say, extra armor that could in be uh, added to the basic uh, lorica, amata, the chain mail, right? Uh, there had already been additional pieces, and then you know, segment the stuff and scale armor is is more evident. By this point, there is definitely yes, the evidence that the, the at least certain type like scale armor, especially was. Um, was more of to be found in the east, but uh, even about this, don't think that we are so, you know, statistically documented, and definitely also any attempt to reconnect the bandit, like uh, the the kind of what we call in modern terms the lorica segmentata, to a sort of you know arrow, um, uh, a protection from arrows, from fundamentally is nowhere to be found right the 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 hardcore issue is the more you put on the better defended you are from anything right the differences in this type of uh, armor were minimal right don't think even just that the segmentata was particularly was or necessarily more expensive than 
the Dolorica Mata, for example. Um, nor that uh, necessarily the, the only thing that defends you at that point is wearing this thing. Um, you also have a shield, you also operate in, in formation, you also have missile um, fire. There is all a, a combined arm tactics that here we, we don't have the time to, to digress on. So it, it's the same for, for the people of the steps, right? Look at the degree of armor they had. It was ridiculously low overall. Um, and most of them went uh, into battle without armor with anything at all, because just the concentration of missile power was enough to just um, uh, to to make you survive, considering how much uh, armor would have cost, how much it would have slowed you down. So it's all about doctrine, in other words. Technology has barely anything to do with that. Um, and um, the by the eve, by the eve, say by this time. Um, the Roman legionary weaponry had uh, surely been perfectioned right as far as surely the technological side of the story was concerned, but also and especially the degree of uniformity. In other words, um, the Roman legionary was uh, one of the best equipped um, fighters um, at the time, and uh, say even though Legionaries, contrary wise to what was commonly believed, um, were not forcefully uh, even armored all in the same degree, and we know very few about that. We know that there were surely differences within the, the formation. That the same, I mean, the yes, uh, how these troops would be deployed, the, the units internally, the availability of armor in a specific theater, the even again the preference. Um, for example, the idea of the first cohort was the strongest and, and was more punching and thus was also more loaded in, in armor uh, by a degree. Consider the legionnaires often bought or essentially made up the, their own armor, and customized it and personalized it and so on. There is all the factor of sanitarization uh, along the borders, there is... Um, surely just the mechanisms to which they came in possession of, of their equipment, right? Part would be given by the state um, uh, that they still have at this point theoretically to compensate for um, and uh, the, in part that there would be allies providing them with these weapons. Rome surely had all the, the type of arsenal even that essentially a Sarmatian armor could have been available to a Roman legionnaire. Not maybe on a regular basis, but surely um, the Romans were already using cataphracts at this point themselves. I mean, Roman, Roman uh, citizen cataphracts. Um, so the 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 thing, um, you know, we know a relatively few about this whole thing. Um, in any case, what what we see is the the, the compactness, the homogeneity, the um, the sense of the spirit of court that uh, this. Uh, slaughtering machine of the Roman army really was right. The entire deal was moral, as we've seen. Rome had reached her um, apotheosis through the essentially a, a religious belief of uh, cultural superiority that she was beautifully embodying uh, at this point. Um, some of the most uh, iconic, of course, weapons of the time were the heavy javelin. The, the pair of heavy javelins usually brought the pila that were usually provided to the, the soldier, like in two kinds, mostly to maximizing, um, you know, the the so the functionality during the charge, but uh, in uh, you know a different uh, range of those meters closing in, but the you know very timed. Uh, fashion, but that wouldn't happen all the time. And actually, probably we don't know. Like we know that every legionnaire had two, right? But we don't know whether he could spend I don't know other six. You know, if he was well supplied enough. And most battles were just um, this prolonged uh, skirmishes, for which the same legionnaires would have employed, especially the lighter types of of javelin. Um, in any case, the the heaviest and the most um, kind of punching was uh, had this a small hand on a long rod made of pig iron right it could bend an impact and thus uh, essentially uh, hampering the movements of 
of, of the enemy even uh, in case it had not been wounded in the process to disrupt uh, the formation and so on. Surely against uh, a submission cataphract that this weapon could have been uh, useful. Uh, but uh, close range kind of hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat would follow um, after the charges. So the, the gladius just per se, or the, the pickaxe, right, may not brought by the legionnaire uh, in combat, but in, in some different situations, in raids, etc., the, the Romans did have uh, the, the capacity to take on a particularly uh, heavily armored uh, enemies. The gladius was this compact right, uh, sword uh, called dagger sometimes, depending on which kind of perspective one assume, considered that the Roman cavalrymen and uh, basically throughout all this time even some legionnaire had been equipped with a spata, right? Uh, this had never actually gone out of use and it may even be possible that the gladi, considering the presence of auxiliaries and um, you know some you know availability were of, of other types were even inferior in number in, in the Roman army to swords like the Spata, right? And the Gladius had actually shortened um, over time to functionalize closer compact, very ever more compact um, Roman legionnaires so were gradually gentrifying and so also abandoning that capacity of simply acting individualistically that they still had quite prominently by some degree um, uh, up to relatively few time before and that were always there right contrarily to what is thought even in the most kind of pointy uh, stock type of, of weapon the, the gladius was very well suited for cutting as well um, in any case, um, not just thrusting, in any case, the design of the Spata was basically the same one of the Gladius Hispaniensis, right, of the first uh, types that sometimes are, um, you know, s uh, even just in art and reconstruction, still lies in the uh, willow leaf kind of shape, but that, if you look at the majority of archaeological finds, were actually sort of spot, also a substantial length. I made a video about the Gladius Hispaniensis types. Um, and so, basically, what the Romans would come back to uh, in, with the Spata in, in the following centuries. So, again, the the stereotypization of the, the legionnaires is sort of just a dagger wielder is a bit reductive. Um, in any case, uh, these plays made their, their job. Um, as we know, the Roman helmet of the imperial, of the early imperial time, was really a, a dramatic feat of engineering that the Romans had drawn mostly from the Celts. Uh, the Italic, the, the Gallic type, in fact, uh, were absolutely impervious to slashing strokes. Right, They were designed specifically in an environment such as the Central European one, which was a degree of Kind of, that kind of individualistic proto-feudal mentality, especially in Gaul. Um, so this idea of being slashed by just a sword hit uh, on the neck, uh, for, I mean, from 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 horseback, right? So, so with this massive neck guards necessary to parry that, um, the, you know, uh, different type of blows that the, this entire structure and skeleton even of the, of the helmet was evidently designed to, to absorb uh, would have been quite effective against um, the the massive sarmatian blades as well, right? Even in this case, the neck guard etc. is not necessarily just because of blows coming from from the above. Uh, if you look at possible uh, legionary fencing, like even there, you know, there would be some kind of wrestling, you know, matches. The the gladius was relatively short to the point that we had just to come very close physical contact with the with the enemy to, to, to just to cause significant damage. So even slashing somebody's nape uh, would have been likely achievable, right? Especially from the side of men that were incredibly just going for it, right? Uh, totally aggressively and minded and completely aware of their own uh, ruthless um, slaughtering capacities, right? Again, the Roman legionnaire was as a human being destroyed through 
uh, an unspeakable degree of psychophysical um, uh, say I would say trauma if it wasn't for the fact it was properly functionalized to rebuild the guy into essentially a person who was capable of killing large amounts of people without without any kind of uh, like just by default right and uh, to a level of efficiency that in fact does not really find equals uh, in, in this context and with a ferocious collective discipline that uh, was able of exalting beautifully also the, the still the very individualistic minded um, uh, background of, of the legion here, right? Uh, the Romans were again properly bloodthirsty but you can't see they collected heads still at this point as a general the idea of human sacrifice was still there right? they came straight from the for essentially a tribal barbarian background uh, from a very few centuries and you know at this point there were surely lots of um, non-italians that were even closer to that past um, as well um, and just also fighting against these peoples from the frontiers was definitely a quite of a quite of a training in itself uh, but in many ways the, the same training in the camp was as brutal as if not more even than, than an actual engagement. As I was saying before, any other consideration about male uh, and the logica segmentata that also, you know, the latter also not being quite just original, it existed in, before Roman times. Um, we've seen that there were some manichae, for example, in just in the Indo-Scythian context, in the Hellenistic world. I mean, it was like it's not a, a very difficult concept to come up with in the first place. Well, the latter was made of iron strips tied on the... Also, there were other material. We, we found some pieces in bronze, as a matter of fact. Again, the material doesn't matter as much as... were probably also organic material. Uh, as much as the, the structure. Um, which also, you know, responds to, to different needs. It's not necessarily just better or worse per se. Uh, this has this strip tied on the inside by vertical thongs, right? Uh, and um, there are general considerations that I will express in, in a better dedicated video regarding the the flexibility, the weight comparison between the two types of armor. However, um, just remember that. Uh, this thing had been just the most successful thing ever or you know it would have just uh, remained the, the one that survives throughout and remains likely prevalent is male um, in any case the um, legionnaire was also protected by other elements such as an armored belt with an armored apron it's a large naturally wooden tile shaped shield the scutum provided with an iron boss at the center um, and bronze or other material bindings along the edge um, as you know well there were different types of shields even here we we don't have any certainty about the kind of shingle type of of scutum being of the early imperial times being the most um, the most used the prevalent uh, even in that specific time was not much of the, the issue Right, uh, it's likely that the majority of Roman legion legionary shields would have been oval, as much as that auxiliaries would use um, square shields as well. Um, and there are even here some considerations that we could make regarding who would use that for what, because there would have been different different tactical, um, let's say, purposes for that. Right, as a matter of fact, the shingle type uh, it's better suited for an individualistic fight not much uh, kind of a collective one right and the Roman legionnaires were capable of doing that so perhaps a more heavily armored guy would just have wanted to venture out there more likely than, than another that would stay more in a sort of shield per, uh, line with you know it could with a flat one it could be overlapped with the others you know that the squared one was is depicted we know if they have exemplaries from Dura Europa's for example was concave right maybe 
part uh, of the of the issue there. After all, consider that the scutum had originally been that concave, right? So in times which the Romans were you know, actually less armored, apparently, but uh, and even about that, there could be an interesting debate. Uh, and it's really complex, but uh, just try to follow me on this. Um, and and that, however, reflected surely a, a more individualistic type of combat of the Roman legionnaire from his, at that point, tribal background. Um, so, uh, we will illustrate the stuff better in another video about the scutum. Uh, also for those who think, ah, but the scutum served to, for, to form the testudo formation. Yes, but the testudo formation is nothing special. First of all, every single infantry in, uh, provided with shield all over history carried out that. It, it's not even a tactic. It's basically a lame way to just protect yourself from projectiles when you do not have a better cover. The Celts did that. We, we are documented about this thing. There is nothing uniquely special about that. Nor surely that type of shield was so much in vogue among the Romans at this point because they needed to carry out the studo. Right? Those are in, in Republican times the, the, that happened as well and the, the Romans made kind of circus entertainment in the local camps, the local communities by, I don't know, uh, making the soldiers running over a ramp of shields held by the uh, the comrades, this kind of stuff. So don't think that here, the the studo or the shield walls. I don't know the the pig snout for me to do all this kind of you know. It's the special tactic that sold. It's it's literally one of the least important things in in the entire warfare of this time, literally. And but kids, emotional kids, have been bombarded with that because they they fundamentally do not understand military logic and they assume that there is something special in a shield wall and that's the level of you know if, uh, if you weren't aware of the fact that most people are not actually brain damaged you know at least of severe uh, intellective deficiencies that we leave that, that we have normalized by now as a matter of okay it's normal no it's not normal it's a mental problem right um and in any case, uh, I I decided to mention the Testudo because if anything, even though it wouldn't really happen necessarily more frequent than in other situations, of course, uh, against nomadic peoples who shoot a lot of arrows at you, such as the Sarmatians or, you know, at least the early Parthians, not necessarily or completely nomadic at that point, um, the Testudo was something in open field without a better protection. Right, and still, this could be carried out in different ways, not just lining up like a little, you know, box, uh, but just remaining with the same, the same line. And sometimes these maneuvers were performed in much messier way. Again, in mostly desperate situations where you wouldn't be able to d protect yourself, you had given up the initiative, and you were just trying to avoid hits while the enemy even at least could could do that without too much of a problem. So again, it's not uh, the big deal that we have, uh, at least that somebody has wanted to, to make this. Right? This doesn't take away anything from the hallucinating level of collective training of the Roman legions, and in fact the ultimate tactical superiority that they enjoyed against all these people. Right? Cause there is not just Cara in military history. Rome was the strongest, and Rome was the one that, on the longer run, would even crush Persia on multiple occasions. Um, in any case, uh, the steps were also, as we've seen, like quite uninteresting for any sedentary civilization to at least to to occupy. Right. So, this frontier uh, we're discussing here is mostly along the coasts, uh, some rivers, estuaries. Some river lines and other, of course, um, settlements that existed at the outskirts of the steppes. And again, there were other people inhabiting sedentarily, even where the Sarmatians here came to rule. So as you understand, these are really introductory videos. I don't pretend to make uh, who knows what, but again, it, it, they turn out to be interesting for some 
uh, even for many actually and so I'm making them so that they remain the string of of videos as a little series and this is not even so little because I have a, I think another dozen of these in, in store um, so we will keep talking about the Sarmatians, the Bosporan Kingdom, the Romans in all separate videos in other series in other times hopefully um, for today uh, I stop it here however I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye